you. Yeah, the, the video is basically about uh, a journalist uh, for a few minutes talking about why there's prohibition. And it's always about following the money. Um, a long time ago, uh, hemp was the number one cash crop in America. And um, some gentleman by the name of Arlington was tasked with cleaning up the drug scene in America. And uh, it was basically about cocaine and heroin and things like that. And they lumble, put into that marijuana. And, um, and then they were approached by some very wealthy people who had interests in the polyester and cotton industries, DuPont, and in growing trees for pulp newspaper and tissue paper and toilet paper. And um, they approached him and said, look, you know, if you've got a lumber, you've got to put into, you've got to lump uh, hemp into the uh, banned substances. And um, he said, well, there's no danger in hemp. It's our biggest cash crop. He said, well, you know, a hemp plant can theoretically become a marijuana plant or start growing a whole lot of THC in it. So you've got to include that. And it's all the same species, the cannabis, cannabis species. So you lump it in there, and here's a lot of money for advertising. The advertising that came out was very politically incorrect. I won't go into some of it because it can be very offensive. Uh, but this lady here, of course, is uh, a person now that is com completely influenced by marijuana and has become a second-rate citizen. And the advertising got a lot worse than that. And it's not exactly uh, a police problem. I'm hearing a lot about the police. The police basically have to follow the law that's been created by politics and politicians. So they, their job is to, to do that. And if they do it reasonably, that's great. If uh, some leaders in the police force want political gain and points, they organize a raid, possibly. So, um, and basically that's it. I mean, that's a bit of a joke, you know, is there a plant in there? Um, but that's about it. But if you start comparing what is legal and what is illegal, and you all know this mostly, uh, the effects of marijuana, which is illegal, it's very peaceful, you know. Uh, the North American Indians uh, used to, when their braves had a fight with a neighboring tribe, used to, the elders used to get them together, sit in a tent supposedly, and pass a peace pipe, which was full of marijuana. And if you're high on marijuana, you just want to hug and love everybody. You don't want to do any more damage. So that was their way of uh, helping, um, you know, violent situations. Now, Forgive me for this slide because it says CBD and THC are the same species. Now, what I mean by that is that CBD, which comes from predominantly from the hemp plant and from the marijuana plant to some degree, and THC, which comes from the marijuana plant and from the hemp plant, uh, are the same species. But um, just like uh, Great Danes and Chihuahuas are canines, they're very different kind of dogs. And CBD and THC in their pure form are different in the way they act on a human being. The... The thing that is interesting about these products is that in, it was really the late 80s, but early 90s in Israel, Muslim discovered that um, the, uh, the marijuana plant and the hemp plant affected the endocannabinoid system. They discovered something called the endocannabinoid system, which wasn't there around, they didn't know about it before. We know that the vascular system is the biggest system in the human body. And then when they discovered the endocannabinoid system, they were stunned because every cell has these multiple receptors uh, that they didn't realize were there, and they were called the endocannabinoids uh, because eventually it was discovered that uh, by their surprise that cannabis activated these receptors or cleaned them up. It's basically also produced a mother's breast milk, and then it disappears again to a large degree. We're talking mainly about something that looks like cannabis oil. And... Um, the, sorry, the endocannabinoid system, a year and a half ago, we thought it was just on cells, multiple receptors on cells. It was just recently discovered, and each cell is like a combustion engine. Each cell has a cell membrane, which has a millivolt charge creating heat, let's say, and food and oxygen come in to combust. So fuel, oxygen, and heat are required for combustion. And each cell has something, on an average, 1.3 trillion microchondria. 
And these microchondria just recently been discovered that they have an endocannabinoid receptor as well, which is amazing. So this endocannabinoid system is rife through the whole body. And um, when, we, when we look at this and how it interacts with the body, um, the, the things that activate these cells and these uh, receptors are um, required for the proper function of the body to bring it into homeostasis and into balance. So to do this, and this is a bit crude, but the, think about an endocannabinoid receptor being plaqued up by toxins, and that's what we eat, what we drink, what we think, what we place in our skin, and uh, they get plaqued up by other things like pharmaceuticals. So it's like a, a bright light that you can work with, uh, do your projects with, and then someone's hit a dimmer switch and you can't work effectively. That's sort of like what happens to the endo endocannabinoid receptors. So what CBD and THC do, loosely, is clean that up so these receptors are firing properly. So when I say that CBD and THC cures nothing, people will go, whoa. I said, no, but that's the fact. It's actually the body that fixes itself when it's been enabled to by the polishing up of these receptors. So the, the thing, these slides are a little bit out of order, my fault. Um, this is talking about hemp and how hemp can save the world. Um, Henry Ford, you know, built a car out of hemp and it was uh, 12 times lighter and 10 times stronger than steel. How's that possible? It's a plant. Well, carbon fibers. If you look at Formula One racing cars that smash into walls, all that's left is this cage and they walk out. That's all carbon fiber. So it's light and it's strong. It can be used for building products and uh, incredibly strong and uh, insect res resistant. It's got great thermal properties. So everything should be built out of that, I believe. Clothing, of course, lasts 10 times longer than cotton, for example. Um, the big ban on plastic bags, just make them out of hemp. So um, it, the nature of this product can change the way the world operates. So the oil companies hate it because you can create a lot of oil out of hemp for fuel. So Henry Ford, not he made the car, most of the car, out of hemp. He also fueled it with hemp oil. So the steel industry wasn't very impressed and the oil industry isn't very impressed. And for some reason, he never built another one. So uh, future building products, 300 gallons, which is what, about 1,300, 1,400 liters of oil. Uh, this is another problem, of course, is other clothing materials use a lot of pesticide, which is now, dioxin and PCB are right around the world. You've got to go 100 meters, uh, 100 feet, I should say, beneath Antarctica to find that there's none of it. Now, Dr. Omote, I come, I'll come back to him in a minute, a little bit later down the track when we're talking about cancer. He is a Japanese doctor that had, uh, stumbled across a way of uh, freezing water and looking at its crystalline structure. He was originally doing it for blood. And when, they, uh, when he was testing the equipment and he used water, he was very surprised that the water coming out of his tap had a very ugly crystalline structure. And the water in his water bottle, which had a bit of Japanese calligraphy on it, which might have said happiness or love, was a, like a snowflake, it was pristine. And he was puzzled by this, and he discovered that a human thought can change the crystalline structure of water very quickly. And when around polluted lakes with 100 people or so, and holding hands and giving positive vibes to the water, and saw the water change from a very ugly crystalline structure to pristine. So human thought is very, very important when it comes to uh, affecting water. And I'll come back to that in cancer in a minute because there's a lot of water in human beings. So CB now is recognized as the world's greatest anti-inflammatory. There's been so many clinical trials uh, done. So it, it just needs to be properly available to everybody. It, and and it's, it's just a plant. The oil should just be a liter in Coles, Woolworths, Aldi, you know, uh, when it comes to CBD. Maybe THC should be available through a pharmacy. Now, when we talk about cancer, um, last year the Australian government said 50% of Australians are going to get cancer. So I'm one of the 50. So somebody sitting next to me is okay. <laughs> so if you look around you in the room, how many people would that be? And they said that 38% will die from it. Now back in 
14 or 15, it was 34%. So the numbers are creeping up. It cost the Australian government about a million dollars per patient, cancer patient. Now, when I talk about cannabis costs, I'm talking about underground cannabis. I, uh, I've heard figures bandied around last year, around 1,200 to 1,500. Scripts have been written last year. Uh, the Minister for Health, Mike Hunt, was very proud to say, look what we've done, you know, we've got, at that time he said 1,000 uh, scripts have been written. And aren't we helping people? Well, you know, that's, that's a drop in the bucket. If 50% of Australians are gonna get cancer, that's about 12 million people. So what's 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 scripts gonna do? So people have to go underground because the, the, the getting a script is very difficult. And then what do you get? I'll come to that in a moment. Now cannabis, a good quality cannabis with other factors can mitigate cancer for around you know, four and a half to five and a half thousand dollars. So I'm gonna talk about um, why I'm here. I suppose a lot of people uh, have used me and my pictures as a poster boy from the effects of medicinal cannabis. And um, my story basically was I had a little red spot on my forehead I couldn't fix. And I thought I'd better have a look at this. At that time, I believed you couldn't get cancema or black salve. It was illegal, still is, I believe. Um, so I had a biopsy done, a little tube with teeth that pulled out a little skin plug. And that was sent away and it came back as a squamous cell carcinoma. And um, what that looked like in three, sorry, in um, four to six weeks, it grew to a large area. So we, we invaded the cancer and it went ballistic and it had to be cut out. So if you've got any kids in the room now, the pictures are gonna get worse. Because once you cut into a cancer, you can seed it. And generally it can go into many places, but the lymph system is a toxic waste dump for human beings. It accumulates all the waste, and uh, that waste is generally toxic because it's acidic. So Dr. Otto Warburg discovered the cause of all cancers, which is basically that uh, it's caused by anaerobism or lack of oxygen, which is caused by an acidic condition, caused by toxins, which can come from your thoughts, from what you drink and eat and breathe and all that sort of stuff. So that's the progression of cancer. So to fix cancer, you've got to fix the toxins and the acidity and get oxygen there. Cancer is not the enemy, it's the last resort of a human body. Because if cancer cells aren't activated at a site where there is no oxygen, all those cells die in that area and they can fall out of your body or in your body and cause uh, bigger problems. So this is loose, right? But the cancer cells are activated, form their own community. They don't need oxygen, right? They need refined sugars. And they'll keep growing until they hit oxygen. So they're in a membrane. If you pierce that membrane, through a biopsy or an operation, other cells can move around and seed into the rest of the body, which is what happened to me. So they cut it out of my forehead, and then uh, the, on the uh, right slide, you can see a lump started to grow on the left side of my neck, which was my lymph node increasing. And it grew, and it opened up, and it grew. The issue was, of course, the danger was that it could eat in my carotid artery and kill me very quickly. And that's what it did on May the 9th, Monday, May the 9th, 2016. I woke up and there was blood coming out of my bandage, uh, which shouldn't have happened. And uh, I was bleeding out of my carotid artery, raised to emergency. And they looked at me and they, three surgeons looked at me <laughs> with an intense light. They said, we can actually see your carotid artery, it's diseased. We can't do anything for you. We can't even operate, you'll bleed out on the table. So what are you suggesting? I said to them, well, have you got your affairs in order? I said, yes. I said, how long have I got? And they said, minutes to maybe hours. Increase in blood pressure, a sneeze, a cough, a movement or a laugh, we'll just burst it open and you just bleed out. So that was interesting news. Um, so <laughs> and I have helped people with cancer for about 38 years, basically by getting their head fixed and their diet fixed. And um, I had researched all different kinds of products and different evidence-based modalities and tried them for a few years. Sometimes I could halt my cancer. Sometimes I got rid of my uh, biggest tumor at that point, which was a three and a half centimeter tumor. A little baby one was left and I had a, uh, when I had a little baby one left, about four or five mil, I uh, had a traumatic uh, family 
uh, experience and very stressful. And that little four and a half centimetre tumour grew into that size in about five, six months. And uh, so that's how quickly it can go. So I was diagnosed originally in uh, October 14. I was given six to 12 months unless I had radical surgery followed by uh, radiation. They wanted to cut this whole side open, take everything out, flesh, tissue, go through three nerves, one will, which would have affected my tongue and how I could speak, and, uh, which is uh, very serious for me. <laughs> so, and the other one would affect uh, you know, the blood supply, the nerve supply to the left shoulder, and I wouldn't have any functioning there. The other one would have given me a general palsy in the left side of my face. And the minimum time I would live after an operation like that, I'd be two weeks in hospital, another five weeks recovering, then six weeks of radiation. The minimum time, because I asked these questions, was two months. People die two months after this operation. And they are happy to say that, you know, their average is five years. And I asked about six, seven years, uh, we don't for head and neck cancers have survival after seven, eight years. But I know from my experience that, you know, this may not be the case. So I rejected that. And when you tell a doctor, I'm not doing what you're telling me to do, uh, they take personal offense, right? Their knowledge is threatened, and they don't want to assist you much from there, which was another story in itself. So uh, just before I started to bleed out, a week before I, and a, a friend of mine, we re independently researched what's the best medicinal cannabis. That was my last resort. I couldn't get it legally. I had to go illegal, but to save your life, this is what you do. So I discovered a, 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 a grower and a manufacturer and a processor that did it, I believe, the right way, and all the evidence showed that. And uh, I acquired that product. Now, acquiring that product wasn't easy. Um, I communicated with the hemp embassy here and a lovely gentleman by the name of Michael, who I now know as Michael Balderstone, uh, sent me an email and said, you know, this is, I'll put you on to a guy. And that guy was uh, an importer of this great CBD and in Northern Rivers. And uh, a friend of mine got it from them because I couldn't do much and uh, brought it to me. So I only started taking it in hospital. And I'm supposed to be dying, right? <laughs> And I ended up, and they injected me uh, to ease my passing with 520 milligrams of morphine intravenously. Now that's a huge amount. If you're going to have an operation, you might have 100, 110, maybe 120 milligrams, depending after the operation for pain. And then they reduce it very quickly, and after a few days, you can't get any more because it becomes very addictive. So I was uh, nearly a month in hospital, and I came out with this box. They called it a driver, pumping morphine and some other drugs into me and uh, because the body is just totally addicted to it. Getting rid of the cancer was a lot easier than getting rid of the morphine. So the, uh, when I started taking medicinal cannabis, which was on and off, my family and friends said to me, you take your oils today? And I was a bit dazed, to be honest, and uh, surprised I was alive after 24 hours, which I shouldn't have been. And uh, I had some great head of nursing and palliative care trying to fix this wound and fix the, trying to contain that artery from bleeding out. And um, lovely people. Anyway, so, as I said, nearly after a month I came out and uh, with a morphine addiction. And the tumor kept growing for about four and a half months while I was on medicinal cannabis. And I'm finding, helping people for the last number of years, tumors have a tendency to still grow until the entourage effect happens when the CBD and THC are allowed to get into the body for a long time. And if you have the right mindset and the diet and everything else, it'll halt it and then reduce it. And the issue was, of course, is that um, this large fungating tumor, uh, when I said, and, and I look at this uh, right-hand picture, uh, that's the cleanest the wound was. There would have been about a glass full of exudate or crap coming out of that daily that's dead cells and dead uh, cancer cells and uh, my own tissue coming out. And uh, that's CBD in action externally. Internally, you can't see it, of course. So that wound on the uh, right there was as clean as it got. And at this point, I believed my cancer was gone. 
because purple inflammation, wherever that went, cancer went. And it reduced back to that and the wound started looking very clean. So every two weeks, a doctor used to come out and have a look at me. And um, he said, okay, yeah, we don't know if the cancer's gone, Michael, but uh, what, we, what we will do is we have to close that wound up. I said, what do you mean? You're going to do a skin graft? He said, yep. So we take two bits out of your butt, two moon shapes, and put it on there, stitch it all in place. And I said, no. And he said to me, look, Michael, I know you've said to 34 doctors no about what should be done, but this is different. That was all about cancer. This is now about closing up a wound. If you don't do that, it's going to take at least three months for that wound to close up, and it's going to uh, you know, be tremendous scarring. You won't be able to turn your head one way or the other way. And again, I said no. And he said, look, I know you've said this to over 34 doctors, but, and I never said that. I said, no, I don't want to go down that pathway. He said, you've said you know, over, to over 1,300 years of medical expertise, you said no to. And all these people point the bone at you. There's no survival. You're going to die, but please let us operate on you. He said, but this is necessary. And again, I said no. And he said, why? I said, well, logically, I'm on 520 milligrams of morphine. No anesthetist in the country has ever put anybody under with that amount of morphine in their system. Ah, oh, but they know what they're doing. I said, I talked to Australia's biggest addiction expert, a medical expert in Canberra. And they, they were astounded I was alive under that much morphine. And yet, you know, and being operated on and putting on a general static is, is risky because it has never been done before with that kind of morphine. So the risks are too high, I said to him. You know, I've survived this now. I don't want to die on an operating table, which is, doctors will tell you, is one of the safest places to be. So... Because <laughs> they've got all this resuscitation equipment and everybody that can bring you back, hopefully. So they, uh, that's what they told me. So uh, it is funny when you think about it. But uh, he, uh, and you know, you tell a doctor no, they feel personally that you're not respecting them. So I generally, if I make a joke, it, it, it eases the tension. And I've met, used this joke before, but I'll do it again. Uh, when you have the skin grafts put on your neck and it all heals up, and then you have. Uh, a friend kiss you and nuzzle you on the neck. That they're kissing your butt, aren't they? They're kissing your ass. So um, when I said that, they are relaxed. And oh God, it's not telling you anything, which is not true. I'm dumb. I'm a dumb bugger. Tell me anything, and I'll I'll be interested, right? So um, they, um, I didn't do it. In one month, that wound. The next day or so after that picture there, the one on the right, it hypergranulated. I don't think I've got any pictures on the screen here. But it went red in the tissue and cells started to grow and uh, started to close up. And it closed up in one month. They were just astounded. And the thing is, um, and I didn't take anything on the surface. Now I know I could atomize some CBD, maybe THC and other things on the surface of the wound to help the healing because I've had injuries since then and putting a bit of CBD in for a few days is amazing the results uh, on, on healing and things like that. So I didn't know that at the time. I was still taking it under the tongue sublingually. And one month it closed up and that was a, a big surprise to everybody. So um, I think I've... Yeah, then it took me seven months to every two weeks to reduce my morphine the smallest amount to get rid of my morphine addiction. And every single time you reduce it by a small amount, you're going through withdrawals. So my heart goes out to people that are on opiate addiction or any addiction, and they've got to stop it. Because even though your mind, my mind said, I can do anything, I can stop this, I can just go cold turkey, forget it. Ended up in the hospital from withdrawals. So I went to the smallest amounts and it took seven months. And every time I reduced it, I was going through withdrawals. Now at the end of October, uh, when this cleared up, um, and the wound closed up, uh, which was early November, um, they sent me away, and I was at that time staying in Yukai. I've gone from Brisbane to stay with a friend in Yukai to either live or die in a great environment, great energy, great food, and um, I was sent to the Tweed Hospital for MRIs because they couldn't do them in Woolumbar, and the MRIs showed uh, and the other scan showed, and CAT scan, everything showed that I was clear of cancer. So um, I have cancer protocols that I have had in the past, and now, of course, since the use of medicinal cannabis, that's sort of changed. 
and uh, in order of importance to get the mind right. So I have a few, few things that I discuss with cancer patients about that. And um, one of them, of course, is how do you get trauma? Everybody that has cancer has an underlying anger or trauma or something going on uh, that needs to be repaired in their thinking. Because a thought, every thought affects electrons in our body. Electrons have a plus 50 to minus 50 charge. So you could be on the right alkalinizing diet, and if your thoughts aren't correct, it won't necessarily become alkaline in your body because the electronic charge. So thoughts affect that. So thoughts are very important on a molecular base, on a molecular level. To get help with the emotions, I'm always suggesting someone to download or to buy the book, The Four Agreements. Uh, I'm told that uh, by Julie that it's uh, available on YouTube quite often. And these four agreements are a way to cover up. You can't ignore what's happened in your life. So if you had a trauma 20 years ago, it wasn't 20 years ago, it was a second ago when you thought about that trauma, you relive it, your body goes through fight and flight response. Adrenaline can be you know, generated and things like that. And that adrenaline and cortisol has to be uh, dissipated by action. If you don't run away or exercise, it sits in your body and can become causes acidity. So stress is very, very uh, impactful on people. And uh, they used to say it was 70% of illness, then they went 80% of illness, 90. Now 95% of illness is stress-related, they claim. So the four agreements is a way, a formula for happiness. If you read it or listen to it from the narrator, which is, takes you about an hour and 14 minutes, it's absolutely brilliant, and it should be taught in primary schools for a way of changing the world to a loving and happy world. Um, the fifth agreement is even better. And also, I, I get people now to look at using the HeartMath Institute's system for mitigating anger and stress. And uh, that is a little device that clips in your ear. It measures your heart rate. So what? It measures the amplitude of the heartbeat and the different heartbeats. It measures the variability between the heartbeats and it puts all this in a very clever algorithm and Bluetooths that to a app called Inner Balance. And that's a very sophisticated app and it gives you feedback on how your emotions and thoughts are progressing your stress levels. And they put your body into high coherence if you follow their system, which is basically a visualization breathing system. But you can see live on the screen on your phone or your pad or your computer how things and what the waves are doing and, and, and you can modify and, and improve your performance all the time. So those two things are very important to get the mind right. Um, I also know a top-notch psychologist in Australia that travels all over the country in trauma sites. She's also an acupuncturist, and people can hook up with them via Skype or by audio, and is one of the most experienced people in helping people's mind and emotions. These are things that are necessary, not just for the patient, but for the family around. And it's not just about re recovering from cancer. It's the aftermath of cancer uh, that is also important to look at, and we don't have time to get into that today. So fix your gut health. It's very important. When you drink... Um, you know, chlorinated water, some places it also has fluoride. These things kill bugs. And you have a lot of these bugs in your gut biome to break down the final stages of food so it can pass the barrier and get into your bloodstream as energy. So um, vitamins and minerals, etc. So if your gut isn't working properly, that's very crucial in cancer. You've got to be able to get that working properly. I talk the, the least expensive way. You need a, a, a large range of bacteria. So if you go to a chemist or health food shop, maybe you can buy uh, probiotics that have three or four different kinds. The most I've seen is about 13. It's about $109 a bottle. And you're going to need several of those in a month. So the cheapest, least expensive way is like water kefir, which is a bacteria that you put sugared water into, the bacteria feeds off all the sugar, takes the sugar out, and leaves around 25 different kinds of probiotics and also CQ10. So that's the least expensive way to have, uh, you know, a glass a day of, of, of uh, probiotics. You need an alkalizing diet, no refined sugar. So even oncologists agree, stay away from refined of sugar, right? But they don't know, of course, that cancer loves cheese and meat. 
anything that creates acidity. And just because a product is alkaline before it enters your body doesn't mean the body's going to react to that. So you can have a glass of orange juice and a glass of lemon juice. When you test them for acidity or pH, they're both acidic, almost the same level. You drink orange juice, the molecular sugar structure of orange juice uh, creates acidity in your body. The, uh, the structure of lemon, when you drink lemon juice, becomes alkaline ash in your body. So two products that are both acidic act very differently. And even alkaline products become very acidic. So all animal products become very acidic. Someone said to me, well, what about fish? Actually, fish on the food chain is, um, uh, absorbs the most toxins. So you don't want toxin if you've got cancer. You don't want toxin anyway. So a few years ago in Sydney Harbour, the Environmental Protection Agency checked the health of Sydney Harbour. They catch a few things and test them. Fish in there had signature radiation from Fukushima. So Dr. Omote, whose picture I had before, said to fix the radiation in Fukushima, just plant hemp. Because hemp is an amazing absorber of toxins and converts it and puts nitrogen back in the soil and it's a great purification device. So the whole planet just used hemp for building, for fuel, for uh, medicine, for paper and, and toilet paper and plastic bags. And uh, it's extremely strong. Anything that's made out of hemp, like you can have a ceramic bowl. If you had a ceramic bowl and you threw it in the ground, it'd shatter and break. You do that to a hemp bowl. Not only is it lighter, but it won't break. It'll just look at you and say, why did you just abuse me like that? So they, um, it's, it's an amazing product. And the whole world should just have it everywhere. So detoxing every day is important. A far infrared sauna uh, helps uh, bring the toxins to the surface of your skin. It operates at a much lower temperature than a Swedish sauna and is nowhere near as stressful. Just make sure your sauna, sauna, sauna doesn't have any EMR, electromagnetic radiation, from the heaters. Um, there's a lot now claiming they don't have any. I've tested one and it didn't have any. Now, a wiggle machine, as I call it, or a Zen Qi machine, is a device where you're lying down and you're putting your ankles on it and it moves from side to side. Why is this good for everybody? One, it's very relaxing. Two, it sends uh, blood uh, going right to the periphery, to all your fine capillaries. Everything gets flooded with blood. It moves your vertebrae around and your organs around, allows space between them for healing. It also moves your lymphatics. So some cancer patients find it very hard to exercise, so uh, even walking. So this device, not only is it relaxing, which is very important, it also moves uh, toxins out of your lymph nodes. It's another benefit from it. And the important thing also is when uh, Julie and I visit cancer patients or locations, uh, we test their house for looking around for toxic things, also looking for electromagnetic radiation, um, which is part of the next bandwagon I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, we're talking about the right product, right oils. So in, in Queensland, for example, if you were given a script, you'd be getting a CBD that the Queensland government got in from Canada. Canada's number one company there make a very good quality CBD, but the one they bring in is too weak to be of any benefit. It's about eight times weaker than the one I recommend and doesn't seem to have any effect on anybody. Um, in New South Wales, you'll get a product, depending, uh, and those products will contain things like um, antifreeze, which might be scary, but it's been used in a number of products before, but it's not a great thing to put into a body. It's got other products in it, and it's meant to be a mouth spray. So a lady rang me up and said, you know, we've got a script, Michael, isn't that great? I said, yes, great. What, are you, what is your script? Said, uh, what's in it? I said, I'm not sure. Send me a picture. So I, uh, uh, Julie looked it up and said, oh, wait a minute. Uh, they want to put this spray into a syringe or into a capsule because the gentleman had um, uh, rectal cancer and uh, she wanted to stick that up his rectum and uh, said, what do you think? because they've been taking the product before sublingually and sometimes putting it in uh, the rectum. And, uh, and Julie said to me, well, it's got ethanol in it, which is used as a dispersant for uh, medicinal cannabis under the tongue because it makes it enter those fine capillaries quite well. Um, it has peppermint oil to make the taste better. It has antifreeze and a number of other products. Now, if you've got lesions 
in your bum or up your rectum, in your bowel, whatever, and you've got these open lesions, and you were to put peppermint oil on them, you'd be screaming. If you were putting ethanol, alcohol on it, you'd be screaming. If you were to put antifreeze on it. So if you were to put this up your rectum, I don't know how long it would take for it to settle down. I don't know how many coffee enemas you would need to settle it down. So these are some of the dangers of not looking and having experts discuss what's required and what products are required. So in some places you will get a, a government provided a script which has CBD and THC in it together. So the issue with that is CBD, proper uh, medicinal CBD, has a very low percentage, like sometimes 0.3 of a percent of THC, which is the psychotropic element of uh, marijuana, let's say, or THC. And uh, some people are very, very uh, susceptible to the effects of THC. So you, you can dose CBD quite safely. And the THC you bring up slowly, just to find out at first how sensitive they are to it. And they can take up to a month to get used to it for some patients. So you want them separated. And some scripts will give you CBD and THC together. And I've known people that take it and they go, oh, I don't like this feeling, I'm out of control. I'm not taking that again. So they push it aside. And some of the products being provided are synthetic. So some large medical pharmaceutical companies, for example, don't um, want to get plantations of, of uh, cannabis and then refine that and extract it and that's an expensive process. So if we can synthesize it, what we think of the active components, and give it to you in body, you've got your CBD and THC. Only problem is synthetic CBD THC does what other things do, it plaques up your receptors and makes things worse. So you want a, what we call a whole of plant extract that's broad spectrum. And the way you do that is if you, you get the plants in the right environment, that don't have any toxins or toxic air, so it has to maybe be under glass, even the outdoors is better. Uh, but if you're in a clean area with no air pollutants, that's fine outdoor, but if you're not, you need to keep it under glass, you need to filter your air, you have the right breezes going, the right species of plant, and you've got to harvest them at the right time to get consistent product. And there's one place in the world that does that. And uh, the importer here also supplies some of it to the hemp embassy. So that's CBD I'm talking about. And uh, with, with, with getting the right product, you've got the best chance for CBD to work. THC is pretty simple. If you want THC, you know, you, you're, half of you know how to do that from the marijuana plant and you heat it and you create oils and you get a tincture out of it. The strength is very important. I've had people t ring me up and say, oh, I'm taking 20 drops of THC at night and it's not doing much for me. I nearly fell off my chair because the, the stuff I talk about and advocate for that THC, if you had 20, you'd be on your back for three days and not moving. So um, it depends, you know, and people say, I need a gram of uh, THC a day, you know? Yes. Really, a gram of what kind of THC? Oh, look, I need a mill of CBD, but what kind? You know, I can have a glass of water, you know, a beer glass of water and a beer glass of vodka. They're both clear, they both have the same volume, almost the same densities, but one acts very different to the other. So the dosing and the strength of the product and the viability of the product, extremely important. So it's been a bit of a hit-miss thing. Now, there's a lot of clinical trials that are happening around the world on these products. So, um, you know, and this is maybe a year out of date. So six years ago, less than 300, and in the last few years, 15,000, and half of them are on cancer. And a third of them have been peer-reviewed and double-blind studied and crossover studied and uh, published. So when I end up sometimes in a meeting with an oncologist or more uh, now, uh, because patients are scared of their oncologists, right? Um, they, um, you know, they say there's no clinical proof. All you have to do is go to your own journals, your own websites, you'll find heaps of trials that have been done. And some of the more interesting ones, we had a, a brain tumor patient who, whose lesions now disappeared and um, one of the things that they reported was that uh, now it's 14 months ago, but they had the test done 12 months apart. The, the uh, endocrinologist was looking at this lady's bone density, which is very poor. She had osteoporosis. So uh, a year on CBD THC, and uh, the endocrinologist said, there's something wrong with this latest report. 
and latest uh, report because one is showing you know, osteoporosis, the other one's showing a 55% increase in bone density. In fact, you don't have osteoporosis anymore. One of these two reports is wrong. Come back in a week for your infu for in two weeks, they were getting yearly infusion and uh, we'll do another infusion for your osteoporosis. But the doctor rang the patient up and said, you don't need it. Those reports are correct. We don't know how you did it, but you've, you've got bone density. Now in January, February this year, I got a report from Canada stating that uh, they'd done clinical trials, double-blind studies on osteoporosis just with CBD alone and a dramatically increased bone density. So this is one of the great saviors for people with osteoporosis. So that, there's so many things that are being discovered that this, these products help. To keep up with it is very difficult sometimes. Um, so you say, yeah, nine drops of CBD and THC will be good for you. Uh, up to 30 drops each, depending on the viability of the product you're getting. So, United States, we just heard recently an international cannabis symposium in the end of March that 80% of the CBD United States is toxic, got toxins. It's a huge figure. Um, so that's not the average around the world, it's less than that, but that's pretty high still. So you don't want to put toxins in when you have cancer. So. I want to say a couple of things before I go on my last topic, which is EMR, electromagnetic radiation. Um, Nimbin saved my life. And Nimbin, directly or indirectly, is saving thousands of people's lives across this country because it was the bastion for keeping uh, marijuana and hemp going. And the importer of this particular CBD um, doesn't you know, do scripts because it's underground. They, they, through their advocates and their independent suppliers, treat around five to 6,000 people a week. That's a huge difference to 1,000 to 1,500 patients in one year through the legal system. So we need to, uh, we, you know, we don't need to do any more research on cancer. You can keep on doing it. You can throw money at it and waste it. The best thing for it is to get the mind fixed, get the thoughts fixed and then get the right CBD and THC, get the right diet, right probiotics, detox, relax, de-stress, have your family around you support you, your friends, uh, very important to fixing cancer. So the, this particular program, there's about three documentaries made uh, that this one sort of starts with like a little bit of conspiracy theory and then it goes into facts and doctors and researchers talking about electromagnetic radiation, the impacts on human bodies. Um, so we, we don't really have 5G yet. We have a couple of trial places in this country. It's about 20 times stronger than 4G. And, um, and 5G is not the issue yet. Our normal Wi-Fi, our normal electromagnetic radiation is the issue. And uh, when we uh, go into a cancer patients' workplace or their home. We have an acoustic meter. Very simple box, not cheap, but it uh, does everything including 5G. And we can monitor where the hotspots are and what to do. So if I turn this on in this hall, uh, you'll see, if you can see it, two red indicators. And I get a readout on the average. If I go here, if I go here, and here, you get these readouts that are doing analog and digital. The, r the right is the average. So when it's green, uh, it has no impact. The radiation has no impact on plants and small-bodied animals and things like that. When it's orange, of course, it does. And humans are affected uh, when it goes into the orange scale. And uh, it affects them in different, many different ways. If you go into red, of course, you're getting toxic exposure. There's not one place we've been where the Wi-Fi is on and other things are happening where it isn't high in the red. In fact, we've been to people's places and they use a microwave and uh, we put a bit of water in it, turn it on, and you want to run out of the room because all the signals are top red. From new and old microwaves, there's no shielding you from it. And 5G and that kind of radiation is used by the military as a weapon it's used in some places for crowd control because a minute exposure to those intense waves will uh, 
If your brain fog, subdue you, you won't think clearly. There's all kinds of uh, things that happen when you are exposed to that kind of radiation. So there's, there's four basic kinds, major ones, and um, in this space, okay, so in this arena, there's all different kinds that are out there. The thing about it is, you, you know, it starts to affect us at 0.0025 uh, milliwatts per meter. And it goes up there. I don't know if you can see these slides, but basically at uh, eight, is it? Eight or six, our DNA is, is damaged. So anything down from there affects all kinds of, kinds of diseases. So there's been many reports and many research, much research done, and the safety standards that have been accepted are set by communication engineers, which is anywhere between four 100 to 2,000 milliwatts per square meter is safe. Now, nothing operates that high as 400. So uh, 5G is way underneath that. So is 4G. So is your Wi-Fi and everything else. So it's like a government body saying, this is the safe limits, and we're not reaching that, so you're okay. Which is not the case, because if you look at some of these documentaries and some of the research that has been done, it'll indicate to you that none of it's safe. So what can we do to mitigate it? Okay, so you, there are paints you can put on your house that reflect it. There are cloth materials made out of these particles that'll reflect it. You can wear it as a t-shirt or a hat. There's all kinds of people out there trying to make money out of it, plugging a product into a wall to mitigate the side effects of EMR, electromagnetic radiation. If that worked, your Wi-Fi wouldn't work, your cellular phone wouldn't work in your house, and maybe your electricity would not work. So it's not working too well. There is a product in Russia. Uh, there's about 1.3 million ton tons of this product. It's called Shugite. And Shugite will block EMR. But you need a large area. I mean, I wear a little piece around my neck to maybe block some of the radiation coming into my body. But it's not big enough. It will block it, though. So there's very little we can do except for uh, turn off those products. The communication companies around the world, to their shareholders, say that things like, you know, the risks to this business is litigation. We can't get insurance, because insurance companies won't insure us if somebody wants to sue us for uh, getting ill or having cancers because of our equipment. So the insurance companies are a wake up, and that's across not just AT&T, which is one of the largest, but right across everything. So. EMR. Yes, uh, I was going to say, Michael, time to wind yep, up, I'm but can, up. You, can you tell us uh, what the reading was on that machine in here? Uh, dangerous. <laughs> Sorry. I'll turn the noise down and I'll point it over here so people can see. We, the left-hand side is a peak uh, radiation, the right-hand side is the average. They're both way in the red. So um, here, and you use this device in all different directions. So I look over here, I'm getting an orange peak, but a red average. If I look over here, I'm getting uh, orange and a red peak average over here. You have Wi-Fi in this room somewhere? It's off? Yeah, turn it on. So we're looking over here, we're in the reds. That's most probably from cellular towers or electromic radiation. It'll take a minute to fire up and we'll see what level it goes to when I point it at that area. But everywhere we go, Wi-Fi just sends everything through the roof. And one of the things you can do, if you want to experiment, that's what? That's, oh, it's, okay, look, it's picking up almost to the top when I look over here in the red, right? It's, it's going very high. So, so right over here, we're- Sounding right, like a Dalek. Yeah. <laughs> when we look over here, and I can't do it Kill all until I do here, it's really high. <laughs> <laughs> now they, they all do this. Uh, here, we've got some other Wi-Fi here as well. So. Okay. So... Anyway. It's, okay. Uh, <laughs> turn it off at night when you're going to sleep, Definitely. Okay. Well, Michael, um, have you got a few closing words to say? We 
probably won't do um, questions because we've got to keep yeah. moving on. Thank you. And what we'd suggest is uh, Michael will be spending some time here, I'm sure, after the talk, um, even out here on the uh, veranda. And if you want to speak to him personally, please go ahead. Thanks, Neiman. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Jeff. you, Michael. Bye.